I would not use divine in, in, in the way that most theists use the word. I, I think if we, if we want to say the universe is divine because it has the laws of nature that gives rise to sentient beings that then become aware of the universe having those laws of nature that give rise to sentience. Is that a thumbs up? If that's, a th that, if that's divinity, then I'm a believer. Okay, so, okay, <laughs> cool. Okay, cool, All cool. Right. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site at TV Santa Barbara in the beautiful Santa Barbara, California. We are now gonna be talking about skepticism around spirituality and much more. We have Dr. Michael Shermer joining us on the Hello, show. Hello, sir. Thank you for coming nice back Nice to on. be back on the show, returning champion. Returning <laughs> champion, Michael Shermer, so excited. And for those that don't know Michael Shermer's background, he's founder of the Skeptic Society with 55,000 members, editor-in-chief of its magazine, Skeptic, a 214-time monthly columnist for Scientific American from 2001 to 2019, presidential fellow at Chapman University teaching Skepticism 101, and a 15-time author with several New York Times bestsellers, most recently The Moral Arc and Heavens on Earth. You can find the links in the bio below, michaelshermer.com as well as skeptic.com. Check out the links in the bio. Michael, let's start things off by asking you about skepticism around spirituality, because we have this we have this beautiful planet that sustains us, that gives us the air we need to breathe, it gives us the water we need to drink, the food we need for nourishment. So many people talk about a spiritual connection to the planet that sustains us and how we have, in a sense, we have disconnected from that spiritual recognition and that's why we have so many of the issues we have in our society. How do you feel about that? Mm, yeah, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, First of all, most of the resources we have from the planet are not given to us. We have to extract them through labor. So, I mean, air and water, okay, that's true. We don't have to do much for that other than breathe deep <laughs> and uh, dip into the, 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 the lake or river uh, or desalinate the ocean. Okay, so, but even that, desalination requires some effort. Everything else is pretty much uh, resources depend on brain power, that is, using our intellect to solve certain problems, to carve out a niche of order uh, in the teeth of the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy of the world just running down. So it's not like we get a gift and we just sit and take it. We actually have to do something. And most of what life is about, I mean, the purpose of life is is extropy, it's to push back against entropy. Uh, other than that, you're, you're dead if you don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, right there, I'd say the relationship between us and nature is a very interactive one. It's not like we just receive a gift uh, at all. Um, I think what you're after is more like gratitude that, that we have this capacity to do this and that we have the resources of a planet that enables us to thrive and flourish, for sure. I would say gratitude is the right ad attitude that we should have. If, but on the other hand, that's how evolution works. If we evolved on Mars, uh, you know, we we would have a different set of physical characteristics to live in that kind of environment or some other planet or moon or something like that. That's about to be tested. We're about to find out what it's like to be a multi-planetary species and what it takes to survive and thrive. So, um, but I mean, I see where you're coming from. I understand the Gaia hypothesis uh, and James Lovelock's metaphor, which may be more than a metaphor. He thinks it's more than a metaphor. The planet is actually alive. So how do you feel about well, that? Well, I think that depends on how you define life. I mean, the planet is not a living organism in the same way that organisms are that reproduce. For example, the planet doesn't make baby Earths. <laughs> so it's not doing that. Um, it's an interesting one. But, yeah, but we do kind of see it uh, breathing with the polar ice caps. Yeah, breathing in, in that in that sense, it's cyclical, processes energy. Uh, yeah, for sure. But uh, so it, this these kinds of things all turn on linguistic definitions. You know, what do you, what do you mean by spirituality? What do you mean by life? That kind of thing. So, but if we don't get lost in the semantics and we stay with this kind of what we feel every time that we breathe, how the planet sustains us, what about that feeling? Yeah, it's a feeling. That's right. It's okay. Again, if you want to remove it from kind of a scientific mechanical 
analysis and just say, you know, spiritually or emotionally, you know, should we feel gratitude? Yes, a absolutely. I'm grateful, uh, you know, for every day that I'm alive. I'm an atheist, so I don't think there's an afterlife. If I'm wrong and it turns out there is, okay, well, I'll deal with that when I get there, I guess. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, I'm just, you know, just feel fortunate that we, you know, ha have, have this little niche of order for some period of few decades, and that, that's good enough. Another way to look at it is that the same thing with your body, you have your, if something's happening in your liver, that inevitably you're gonna have issues within the potential your kidneys, with your stomach, with other lungs, other areas of your body, and then you may even die. Similarly with our planet, if we're going extremely uh, over the edge with the amount that we're extracting from the planet, um, the way that we're polluting the ecosystems that we live in, then the planet sees that as, a, as part of its organ dysfunction, dysfunctionality and then works its way to potentially even, <coughs> even spray us off like a, like a bad case of it, like <laughs> insects on it. Yeah, I think the environmental movement should take more credit than it does for that awareness. And not just awareness, but actually let's do something about it. Now, I understand most nonprofits, because I run one, are, are, are kind of have a strong impulse to, to cry gloom and doom because that's what brings in more donations. If you, know, if you just say things are great and getting better, uh, people feel like, well, then I'm going to find some other cause to donate to where things are bad and getting worse. In fact, I think the environmental movement has had a huge positive effect since the 60s and 70s of cleaning up air, cleaning up the air in most major cities, uh, Los Angeles, you know, just south of us here. I mean, this is where I was born and raised. In the 60s when I was a kid out playing baseball and in the, in the 80s when I was a cyclist, you, you had to be done by like 10 or 11 in the morning for say May to September, October. The air was so bad, you know, that's just not an issue anymore. Why? Because we cleaned up the air. Most of the major uh, waterways in America have been cleaned up. That's thanks to the environmental movement. You know, the whole scare about overpopulation, that's a non-issue now. Uh, really, I mean, it's it, the, the way we're going, uh, underpopulation is going to be a problem in, in a century or two. So, I mean, and that's because people have decided, okay, we're going to do something about this. And other pressures, like the more economically prosperous families are, particularly women, the less likely they are to have more kids. So family size decreases with economic pros pros prosperity and political freedom for women, for example. So all those things, I think things are good and getting better. And uh, so all the scare stories you see on the news about uh, environmental problems, th th those have to be put into context. You know, follow the trend lines, not just the headlines. Yeah, and there are definitely is a massive shift towards uh, cleaning up some of the ecosystems that we've been polluting, that type of stuff. Um, simultaneously, um, we, we do see a pretty in, um, immediate-ness uh, that we have with uh, staying vigilant with the way that certain businesses are maybe uh, signaling that, hey, things are totally good. Meanwhile, we continue a process of extracting, plundering the earth, selling you things that you may not even really need, that you're just buying mm. to impress people that you don't even like, and then Furthermore, is the cyclical process of that conspicuous consumption and the disconnection that people have, the filling potentially some of the fragmentations that they have with their own divine understanding of who they are and what their purpose is with filling those voids with temporary satiations and pleasure that aren't mm. even... I'm not so worried about that because that's so subjective. Uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting, you know, cell phones, for example. I see you have an iPhone. Totally. Cell phones, and computers, it, things like that. This is all great, and, and you could counter and go, well, but we're using these rare earth metals, and they're called rare earth for a reason, because they're rare, and China has most of them, and, you know, this is fraught with, you know, political implications and tariffs, and, you know, what do we need these for anyway? Well, you don't need them. You know, I, I, I'm old enough to remember a life without any of that stuff, right? Uh, and, and life was fine then. It's, I feel it's richer and better now, but that's, that's kind of a subjective thing. I'm more worried about more immediate climate denial, for example, on the part of uh, Republicans, the, this political issue that, uh, you know, climate 
science is a liberal conspiracy against big business or whatever, we, that's a more immediate problem that has to be you know, countered, which is, I'm working on that. We're working, lots of us are working on that. Uh, but, you know, again, if, if a Democrat gets back into, in, into the White House in 2020 or 2024, those trends will be uh, reversed. So, uh, again, the long-term trend is good uh, towards in the environment. Immediate uh, problems, I think, w do need to be addressed. You know, climate, uh, I'm still worried about nukes a bit. Not a bit, but you know, it's probably even more of a threat, I think, than, than climate change, even though things are much better regarding nuclear uh, Super weapons. Super intelligence, synthetic biology, AI, all that. You know, they're, they're on the list, right? They're all there. And, but yeah. at the same time, all of the these pressing fields of exponential technology and the geopolitical uh, uh, difficulties that we're facing dealing with them, the, these these things stem from the same place. Let's see if we agree on this. Do we? Do you feel as though the issues that we have in our society with denying the changing climate and all these things that you listed as well, that or maybe the way that we're just not consciously plundering the earth and selling things to people that maybe they don't want or need, maybe that that all stems from the same place, which is our our uh, lack of understanding of the ecosystem that we are all born from this planet. Mm. What do you, how do you feel? I don't know, that, that feels a little, it seems a little California holistic from the 60s. Um, people, I think generally most people want more stuff. And that if you tell them, well, you don't really need a McMansion <clears throat> to impress the, the neighbors or whatever. It, it, I don't know, it feels, that feels a little parental to me, you know, that some elitist telling the masses, you don't really need all these things, you know, because life is, can be, can be just as well lived and happy and satisfying without any of that extra stuff. You know, meanwhile, the elitists have all their stuff, you know, and the Al Gores fly in private jets or whatever. It's like, or it's like us telling China and India, you know, you can't have an industrial revolution because look what we did, you know, and their attitude is, well, fuck off. You know, we're gonna, you had it and we want it. And I understand that, that, you know, so I think instead of thinking like that, like, let's see where we can cut back and, and curtail things down. Let's think of it as problems to be solved and keep going forward and let people do whatever they want uh, <clears throat> and, and just continue to solve the problem. So, for example, I can't remember if I used this with you last time we talked, but Which example? <clears throat> the, 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 the line, we will never run out of oil. Mm. Th this is never going to happen. And that sounds insane because it's a finite planet. At some point, you would pull out the last barrel of oil. No, no one's ever going to pull out the last barrel of oil because it'll be too damn expensive. At some point, when the supply really does start to dry up and we really do hit peak oil, whenever that is, the price will just become too high and we'll have to find alternatives. So electric cars instead of, instead of internal combustion engine cars. That's already happening. You know, by 2050, I don't think, I think internal combustion engines are going to be a thing of hobbies at racetracks you go to to drive for fun. Everybody else is going to be driving electric cars. All right, this is already happening. So rather than saying, let's all cut back on the amount of driving we do because internal combustion engines are bad for the environment. No, let's say, let's drive all you want and find a better solution for powering the car. Now, eventually, this may all solve itself if no one even owns a car. And, you know, some predictions are that, um, that, it, that all cars will be like Ubers, you know, just people ride sharing and, and hardly anyone will own a car. Okay, maybe that's another solution. I don't know. You seem to be pointing to the pie. So the pie staying in zero-sum territory is, yes, potentially look, can look like an elitist doing whatever they want with however many things they want and telling other people to not purchase those things and not strive to, to uh, materialistic ownership. Uh, at the same time, uh, we agree on a positive sum pie. Yes, everything is able to... Um, be better for as many people as possible. The degrees of freedom that are opening up mm. around the planet for people to endeavor into whatever they find most meaning in pursuing is, is a beautiful thing. Um, to be able to have uh, electricity, to be able to have that, to uh, have enough nutrition, to be able to um, survive and uh, be able to pursue what you, pr uh, what you find most meaningful, extremely important. At the same time that the, uh, the recognition at least for people that are birthed into the world of understanding that all of the different things that they have, that 
that they're given. They're given life on this planet. That in itself is such a beautiful thing, first and foremost. Are we really, it seems as though all of the ancient traditions are pointing to the same thing, mm. that they're pointing towards our disconnection from the planet that sustains us. Mm -hmm. And that our lack of understanding that is why we have both a hyper-functional society in many ways, like we agree on, but also the dysfunctional aspects of it are due to that. Mm. Yeah, here I think I might turn to the study of uh, positive psychology, happiness, and meaningfulness. So these are two different things. Uh, you know, what makes people happy, what makes them feel like they have a meaningful life. And, you know, for a while there was this meme going around that, uh, you know, money doesn't make people happier. Uh, well, that's easy to say if you have a lot of money because <laughs> uh, you have your needs met. Try telling that to the, you know, half the population that, you know, is below 30,000 a year or whatever the, the, the cutoff is, you know. We now know from better studies that actually having more money does make life better and that makes you happier. You just, it gives more degrees of freedom. You know, if I have more money, I don't have to worry about a budget. I can go out to dinner anytime I want. I can buy my kids whatever toys I want. We can take trips whenever we want. I don't have to worry about it. That actually is liberating. And so making, having more money is good in that respect. That said, you don't have to have that because in terms of what makes life meaningful, none of those things that I just described, except for maybe you're raising your children or something, but it, it, that doesn't have to do with the amount of toys they have. Um, to lead a purposeful, meaningful life, it, it has to do with challenges and, and meaningful work, purposeful work, family, love, relationships, uh, and, and the more spiritual things as, as you might describe them. So here's how I say it. I teach a class at Chapman to freshmen. These are first year students right out of high school. So I give them a whole, basically skepticism 101, how to think. But I also teach them how to think about happiness and, and meaningfulness. And I tell them, go out and make all the money you want. Money's great, that's fine. But in the long run, that's not really where it's at. I mean, you can lead a perfectly meaningful, happy life without making a lot of money. And there's a lot of people that, that do that. That is all subjective, right? And the, so the, the movement toward making people aware of, you can have a purposeful life without all the trappings. I don't want to tell people you can't have the trappings. Have all the crap you want. Uh, but really, in the long run, you can do it or not. And, and you're, at the end up over here, you can give all of that up and still have a meaningful life. And that's okay, too. So really, I'm a, I'm a, big, I'm a big freedom guy. You know, do whatever you want. Just, you know, don't, just don't tell me what I, I can do. And you do what you you do your thing. I'll do my thing, but but it, it's worth making people aware of. You can do all of that without any material things. There's plenty of people that live at a say middle income or something, and they're perfectly happy and they lead meaningful lives. That's okay too. And potentially even some of the most uh, most connected um, humans to what sustains us are the ones that are. <clears throat> not pursuing material wealth, pursuing spiritual wealth um, and abundance in that sense. Now, I want to, I want to. We've touched on this in the first time that we sat down together. It's this um, idea that you want to be just uh, skeptical enough um, to make sure that all of these um, falsehoods are not coming into your um, knowledge base and essence, while simultaneously giving enough room to certain. Um, theories that you can then go and hypothesize about and prove and that way um, you can gain um, new knowledge as you do prove those things out. So it seems as though one of the things that is probably really important to give a little bit of room to is spirituality with mm -hmm. science. So if science lets spirituality kind of push the edge of knowledge a little bit and then we make this hypothesis, right? Something like the earth is alive. The earth is an alive ecosystem that is kind of having an allergic reaction to the humans right now. Something <laughs> like that, let's say. Yeah, metaphorically Metaphorically speaking. speaking. But then we scientifically probe it, right? With like, okay, the parts per million of CO2 are now not 300, but four, over 400. Then we look at some of the ocean areas that are acidified. We maybe look at some of the glacial melt systems, right? There's a lot of variables to take in. Even solar flare intensities, all these types of things. It's very hard to calculate these things. But once you start like giving spirituality a little bit of space and then you poke it scientifically, well, how, do you, how, do you, how can we best do that style of a problem? Uh, I think I think maybe what you've described is not really part of science but kind of the social aspects of science or the metaphysics of science or the 
spirituality of science, you know, the soul in science. Um, that's all part of it, for sure. Science is in everything. Um, you know, I don't know what you want to call that part. You know, I like the art, soul of science. The soul well. of science, yeah. Art, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, I wrote a, a little booklet called The Soul of Science. and Or was it Science in the Soul? No, I think it was The Soul of Science. Because <laughs> Dawkins wrote a book on this too. Now I'm confusing his title with mine. Anyway, the point is is that, you know, there there are how you interpret the results. And um, again, I don't, you know, I like metaphors, but I don't want us to take them too seriously. You know, the earth is alive and it's allergic to humans. You know, it's, I, I think the earth doesn't care whether we're here or not. And I don't think it would make much difference in a million years. You know, what, whatever we do, it's going to come bounding back. I mean, look what happened after. You think uh, it's a divine accident that humans ended up it, being on the planet? Not divine. It's it's just an it's accident. Just an accident. Just an accident. So there's no divinity that. Yeah, humans, there's no divinity. No. You, you In know, other words, I'm with Gould on this. You know, rewind the tape and tweak the variables a little bit. We wouldn't be here now. If the asteroid now, didn't come, all these things. Right now, some people argue that there's a certain amount of directionality in evolution. That something like a bipedal primate uh, with tools and a big brain on one end and the waste disposal system at the other end. And so there's only so many ways to structure a land creature that it, that, 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 that would have ero arisen anyway. I'm not sure about that. I'm a little skeptical of that. Bob, Bob Wright makes this argument in Non-Zero, that in his book Non-Zero, that, that there's a slight advantage to non-zero plane organisms versus zero sum plane organisms, and the, and the former outcompete the latter just slightly and that leads to cooperativeness, altruism, love, and things like that. Okay, that has happened. Uh, if we find life on another planet, uh, that would be a second experiment. Did it happen that way there? And then the more we find other planets with living organisms, we can then run that, see that experiment, how it played out. And simulate our own. Or simu like and simulate our own, right, yeah. So, um, but either way, I think clear, it's clear we do play some kind of a role, and, and so it's not really fair to say in a million years it won't matter what we've done because it'll all come back, back if we, even if we nuke ourselves. I mean, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, if you go there now, you would never know except for they left a, a building left from 1945 just to remind people. They came back, bounding back. Actually, within weeks, they were you know, rebuilding the city and so on. If you looked at, at the photographs, in 1945 of what Europe looked like, particularly most of the cities in Germany, just rubble. You go to any of those cities now, you would never know this happened, other than they have that kind of awful 70s architecture, 60s and 70s architecture. But other than that, you know, they're thriving cities. So, I mean, things come back much faster than we think. And, you know, after the, the, the meteor strike 65 million years ago, you know, that wiped out uh, most of life on Earth, but still here, it's, you know, just, uh, they bounced right back. So I think Which we also only really discovered within the last couple of decades yes. as something that actually happened. Yeah. Which again, we're so uh, amnesia, we have so much amnesia to understanding how we actually got here. And so to be able to go and like have the proper archaeology, the proper anthropology in order to understand how we got to this point is so important. But is it really just an accident of evolution that we're here? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> okay. I don't think there's anything. I mean, okay, look, look, we only have an N of one. So, <laughs> we, you know, you and I and everybody, we're just talking through our hats, okay? If we, you know, in 100 years from now, we come back, we're chronically frozen, we come back 1,000 years from now or whatever, we have this conversation. And it turns out we have now, you know, an N of, you know, 657 uh, inhabited planets with intelligent life and so on. And we see, oh, wow, this is a certain inevitability to evolution. It leads toward intelligence. Okay, then, then that then my accident hypothesis is probably wrong. But does it also potentially give room for some for a soul to come through in a body into the world and be a soul? What do you being, mean? See, this these are the hard questions. <laughs> what do you mean? I know soul? these are very tough yeah. things. So that could be then like a very Occam's razor esque approach. Let, to let it. me point Maybe out that uh, consciousness uh, just comes directly conscious, from uh, but like a consciousness, yeah. is, is sentience, consciousness. Se so, so sentience either just that's better than soul. So set, okay, we'll go, <laughs> yes, yes. So we'll go with this idea of just sentience emerging um, from a complex biological phenomenon that has occurred um, between, uh, from the earth to humans reproducing. And when I'm born through my ancestors that I 
um, and birth with sentience because of a complex biological process of perception, yes. all that stuff. I think that's probably very common in the universe. I suspect sentience probably is because okay. it, com it comes on pretty early, depending on how you define it. Uh, you know, the living, all living organisms are sentient in the sense they respond to their environment, they take in information, they process the information, they respond accordingly. Uh, at some point, if you want to throw in self-awareness, then, then that reduces the, the end by quite a bit. But there's still, I think my dog is self-aware in a certain level, less than, say, a chimp, less than a human. But, you know, that, that, so anyway, I think that once you get complex life rolling, then something like sentience consciousness will arise. You know, just just being aware of your environment and responding to it in a general sense, that, that is probably pretty common. But coming it, through it, with it, something it, like a spirit is not... With, See again these words. These, these words. words you use. What do you mean by spirit? See, but okay, I'm I'm responding and assuming that you're using the word the way the traditional theist uses the word. You know, in a dualistic Cartesian way that there's something beyond the physical body. And that, how do you feel about that, that? So, well, I'm skeptical of that. I'm a monist. You know, I don't think there's anything such such thing as mind that floats above the brain. It's not, you know, there's the, the, the neurons with their synapses and the neural networks all connected. But the, what the theist thinks is that, you know, that the soul, like upon death, floats off the, the brain and goes off into the ether or the quantum field state or whatever. Well, where did we all come from? Big Bang. So, so did we all come from a place of unity? Did we all come from one source? Well... That's a, yeah, I mean, if you, the singularity that banged, yes. Okay, so if we all come from that one source, is that, could we then ascribe potentially the word God to all that is? Metaphorically, I guess you could. Okay. But and, again, the average theist Christian is not thinking, could, the, you know, the big bang could singularity. Then all sentience be the nerve endings of God? <laughs> okay, <laughs> now, you're, now you're sounding like Deepak Chopra or I don't know what. <laughs> You see, what do you think about You've that? been spending too much time with these uh, these gurus and these psychedelic gurus. Uh, they're not they're not psychedelic gurus. <laughs> okay, they're, they're not. They're just it's just ancient wisdom. Ancient wisdom. Yeah. And you know, I also come from a very deep science yes, background from yes. multiple disciplines. Yes. So to be one that can kind of you know play with both and try and see what edges of knowledge can be pushed, what things we can remember. Okay, from so where well, we come from. so take your friend. Uh, um, Ray Kurzweil, you know, is you know, is there a God? Not yet, but we're working on that. You know, the singularity of you know this super advanced AI would be God-like. That's true. Again, mo the average person thinks of God as this personal being that brought the universe into into being, created us, knows about us, cares about us, and is creating a, an afterlife for us. Okay, I don't think that's what you're talking about. And I think that's actually a pretty straw man argument for God. I think it is. I think God just being all that is from the Big Bang until now and Earth potentially not being just an accident of biological evolution, but really something that's profoundly beautiful that has evolved humans that are able to figure out they're supposed to remember in a sense that we all come from the same place and that nature sustains us and that we have to work together across this planet. And that when we forget that, it makes space for some of the, uh, the, 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 the corruptive uh, aspects of our, of our okay. world. All right. So, so All does right. that, that's maybe more of a, 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 a steel man argument on the point of yeah, maybe. God and Well, I mean, you know, Sagan famously said, uh, you know, he, humans or brains or consciousness is a way of the cosmos to know itself. Mm -hmm. You know, because we are stardust. Yeah. You know, we're just the, uh, the product of stars that went supernova. You know, we are carbon and so on. Uh, okay, so if that's what you're after, yes, I can see that as a m kind of a metaphor, although it's literally true. Um, we are the way for the cosmos to know itself. Yes. But I don't want to impugn the cosmos with agency, like it's a thing that is, a, mm -hmm. it itself is aware. We are the cosmos's eyes and ears mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So now, that's beautiful, though. The perception of the Big Bang, of all that is, is now in the sentient life forms that are perceiving and experiencing this beautiful experiment that we're, that we're in. 
So, but see that right there, science, right? We can link something like like Sagan talking about the cosmos observing, experiencing itself with something that spirituality has also been talking about about how we're all children of the cosmos coming through this experience. So, I think by being able to merge that science and spirituality right there, it can actually do really beautiful justice for us understanding why we're here. Yeah. Well, if it motivates people to act in a, in a more healthy way, both for themselves personally and socially, okay, that's fine. I mean, that is kind of the role of myth and metaphor in literature is mm -hmm. to motivate people, is to reflect something about the, the world, not in a scientific way, but in, in another way that then motivates people, moves them emotionally. I mean, this is that this discussion that I've had with Jordan Peterson, who, you know, he's a big myth guy, and the, the importance in, of myths and stories in human society and personal lives. It's huge, yeah. Yeah, and I think he's right about yes, that. Yes, yes. Um, you know, now, and, and there's a body of literature now on evolutionary psych, on evolutionary literature. You know, to what extent do stories actually reflect the true nature of human nature, for mm. example. In other words, the novelist had, had this figured out before the scientists did. Mm. You know, they, just by observation, just by looking around and having life experiences, they realize there's certain themes that come up over and over and over in literature. And that's because they're real. They're reflecting something that's real in human nature. You know, love, relationships, power, deception, and you know, the, the, the better angels and the inner demons, you know, the, all those characteristics we study scientifically, they're there in all the novels centuries ago because they're true in a sense. So that, that to that, I'm, I'm willing to grant religion, myths, you know, that sort of Joseph Campbell, pre-Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson, Joseph Campbell's, um, you know, kind of looking for the commonalities amongst world myths Either they got there through diffusion, cultural diffusion, or they are rein reinventing the same ideas because it's reflecting some underlying reality. And these myths that, that cover such important aspects of the human experience are also ones that indigenous elders are also mentioning um, with regard to where we all come from and what sustains us. And so by being able to piece these things together, I think it does help us uh, behave in a more healthy and sustainable way moving forward. Some of the things that we maybe um, are currently uh, deceiving us so when we come into the world, do we come with a purpose? Do we come with something that we know is going to bring us the most meaning and then it's our responsibility to figure out yeah, where that is? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I do think so. I mean, again, social scientists that study this, you know, come up with certain things that are true for most people most of the time. Again, having meaningful work, having family, you, know, you don't have to be married, but having some kind of loving relationship with another human being, uh, you know, having children, uh, you know, and, and doing something that takes you out of yourself. You, know, you work for a nonprofit, you belong to a church, you volunteer on the weekends, you do something with a community of people to some common cause. You know, that, that leads to spirituality. Some people get, you know, do meditation or they do long walks on the beach, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or, or they go to church. You know, there's, not, there's, there's lots of ways to get it. No one group has a monopoly on mm -hmm. that. Clearly, this is more than what science is offering by itself, but science can study it and go, look, these are the things that the happiest people do. You know, just like in the same way that longevity researchers, you know, look for the, the you know, the blue zones, the, the places where people live the longest. You know, they eat fish or the Mediterranean diet or whatever, but one of the characteristics is, is a community, a, you know, a social community where you have friends and people that care about you, that you care about, relationships, that kind of thing. And so there, I, th I think, to the extent that the ancient wisdoms or religions or myths have talked about that, they probably figured that out through trial and error and observation. I think it's important to, to make a point because you keep bringing up you know, these wisdom elders and so mm -hmm. on. You know, a, a lot of them came up with crazy ideas that turned out to be just utter nonsense. Mm. And we should recognize that just because someone is an ancient elder doesn't mean they're right. Uh, they could be just completely off the rails. So mm -hmm. again, you have to check the ideas yeah, uh, yeah. with reality. Um, so, I mean, uh, there was a slew of books in the 70s and 80s, you know, the, the Dancing Wooly Masters, the Tao of Physics, um, The Turning Point, you know, Frijof Capra. I read all those books. I loved them. Great stuff. 
you know, the kind of marriage of Western science with Eastern tradition. And, uh, you know, some of it turned out to be, you know, okay, there's a match there. Others, oh, that's a bunch of nonsense. There's no link there. Uh, and so it depends. We can't just say just because it's old, it's true. Yeah, yeah. because you, we can easily be deceived by um, people that are carrying something that, uh, that is, um, that could potentially, yeah, be de deceiving us. And that's, that's very bad as well. The, yet we can also, like a long walk on the beach can be different for someone that is deeply connecting to the ocean and the, the origins of our life. That is so much different than someone that comes to the beach, takes a selfie of themselves, and starts posting it on the internet. And so these are completely different ways of, of perceiving the world. There, there's a reason sense. beachfront property is so much more expensive uh, than inland property. Or if you're inland, having you know a spectacular mountain view or being up on a cliff overlooking a valley, those homes are more expensive. There's And this is not just some random quirk of real estate. I mean, the location, location, location is defined by a, a very certain uh, characteristics I, that I think does tap into human nature. You know, Ed Wilson calls this biophilia. We love nature. Um, and we love the biosphere and, you know, acacia trees, bodies of water, crashing waves, sand, you know, cliffs and, you know, looking down. And now there's much debate in evolutionary psychology about why that is, or even if it is, because there's criticisms about, about that, you know, like certain landscape paintings are, are rated high, higher than other kinds of paintings. And yet some of the most revered artwork has nothing to do with nature or anything like that. Uh, so it, it, I'll admit it's a, it's a debated point, whether it's an adaptation or it's just a byproduct. Steve Pinker calls this cheesecake. You know, like certain kinds of art, it may be just cheesecake. It's just, it just tastes good for some other reason, not having to do with that particular thing. Anyway, um, but the point, the deeper point is that we do, what you're after here, this kind of spirituality connected to the earth, whether there's a, a, a evolved adaptive reasons for that or not, clearly it's something in our nature. Oh yeah, that and we, we care proving about those it things. with science now too, where people are walking out into forests, and now we're calling it forest therapy, that cortisol levels decrease when you go oh, yes. out in the forest. Just things like this. Hug a tree. <laughs> Hug a, like, c come on, I mean, do we really need to be probing this so much with science to actually finally understand that me going out into nature will help me decrease my stress levels? It's pretty damn obvious. Yes, it is. Um, yes. And then the way that you behave there. Are you going there just to take a selfie and immediately start posting it? Or right. are you going there to actually connect to the essence of our origins? Completely different take on it. Um, Don't take of, your cell phone into the forest. <laughs> there's, yes, yes. There's there's this. Take a, Go a day without using the, the technologies um, and see how you feel afterwards. It doesn't feel good for the first day. I've done this. So after about day two or so, then the anxiety starts to come down. And after like day four, you're like, I didn't really need that phone. Uh, life is pretty damn good without it. It's pretty damn yeah. good without it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in thing, and how much more focus do you have on getting things done that you want to do? But then again, also, if you were offline for a week during the time that I just figured out a couple of days ago that I was coming down here, we wouldn't have been able to coordinate and right. make this happen. So there's so all the Jews with the Sabbath, with the Sabbath. Yes. Okay, not just the Jews, but you know they, they're the ones that make the biggest deal about it. You know, midnight or sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Um, you, you know, some of my atheist friends make fun of religious rituals, but um, really, some of them have some grounding on that. Um, you know, yeah. it's it's a it's a way of carving out a niche of of time for you and your family and yes. nothing else and that's good yeah that's good i once made fun of uh, the mormons wearing the, uh, the the secret underwear right and in the audience was a mormon woman who said well okay dr Schirmer, come on that's not very f it's not i don't really secretly think the underwear is doing something to you know it's just a way of my honoring the tradition or my paying respect to you know the authority of the church or something like that. And I, I forget her exact words, but I, I changed my mind about that. I thought, okay, I, I see that. I, I get that. Okay, let's, let's, let's tackle this one. So there's a, 
uh, we gave this example earlier. I think it's a really good one to kind of start things off with. This idea of humans just have a deep amount of amnesia happening with like our origin story because again, a couple decades ago, we weren't sure that the, that the extinction event of the dinosaur era was due to asteroidal impact. And now we know that and it makes way more sense that that made space for the humans to evolve. You know, very similarly, we can start thinking about these things of, of things like um, the Gobekli Tepe, you know, the, the site that you were talking about with Graham Hancock. And um, I think these are actually very profound um, I, uh, archaeological discoveries of us that, holy cow, how many ancient sites are buried in our planet that are yeah. slowly like disappearing, but that we need to go and find to piece together our story of how we got here. And I do think, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts about this, I do think there are gatekeepers. I think there are gatekeepers that prevent us from advancing certain aspects of not only our origin story, but even more about things like lobbies. There's lobbies in the lobbyists in the pockets of different governments around the planet that are that are pushing their own personal agendas around uh, pharmaceuticals or around uh, fake foods and fake physicians and fake politicians and that. So, so these types of things, and there are gatekeepers that are that have literally set up different styles of defenses that are preventing the 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 truth. It's being obfuscated yeah, yeah. in a sense. What are your thoughts about yeah. all that? Well, on the first point, uh, I think Graham is correct. There's a lot of these sites that uh, are clear the people didn't live there. They went there to do something, uh, and it was pro it probably was something like a spiritual, religious whatever that word would have meant to them 10,000 years ago, say, something like that, Gobekli Tepe, maybe. Um, you know, my archaeoastronomer friend uh, at the Griffith Observatory, his name escapes me now, I'll think of it in a minute, um, you know, he, he talks about the, a lot of these archaeoastronomy sites as they are kind of spiritual sites where you go to kind of pay respect to the cosmos, that kind of thing. And we've kind of lost that. Yeah, uh, yeah, he makes a point that uh, he has, tells a funny story that there was a blackout in Los Angeles, you know, one night, I think it was 1986 or something. And the next day, the observatory got, Chris Observatory got all these calls like, there was something weird about the sky. It's like, yeah, you could see the stars. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we need more of that. We need more of that. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I think. But I, in terms of this amnesia, I do think that this proliferation of channels and science shows has trickled down to where everybody now knows about the Big Bang and the theory of evolution mm. and Neanderthals and this and that. And, you know, science popularizers mm -hmm. uh, are, you know, they're everywhere now. And there's yeah, a lot yeah. of great material. And the CGI is so good on these shows now. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the new Cosmos reboot, but, uh, but they all have fantastic CGI, you know, what does a black hole look like, you know, and, and in, that ser in that film, uh, Interstellar, you know, they consulted Kip Thorne and he gave them the equations that this is how, uh, how, how to portray a black hole. So what you see is what a black hole would actually look like. And, and it's so real, particularly in a theater. I mean, you could almost viscerally feel what it would be like to be near a black hole. So I think that's helped. In terms of, you know, like Carl said, uh, Sagan said about Cosmos, it, it is our story. Mm -hmm. It is an origin story. It's a myth. Uh, but it has the benefit of actually also being true. Mm -hmm. You know, most religious myths, maybe they're true, maybe they're not. Who knows? Mm -hmm. There's no mechanism mm -hmm. to test it. And that wasn't the purpose anyway of the story. But for the modern scientific origin story, it's also true, which makes, to me, makes it even more meaningful. So when I go, I visit observatories. I like to go inside yes. those huge domes, you know, like Mount Wilson up above Los Angeles, go down to Mount Palomar with the 200 inch. I've been to a bunch of them. And to me, it's like going to church. And I've been to the big cathedrals in Europe, the Shark Cathedral, the big dome in, in Cologne where my wife is from. Oh, it's, it, I can really feel the emotional spirituality that believers get, even though I'm an atheist, because those, those structures are so impressive. They are so huge. And I can see, you know, let's say 500 years ago, when that was the biggest thing anyone will ever see in their life. They transcend people's egos working in cooperation to make these beautiful Centri structures. Centuries long yeah. work projects, yes. Yeah. 
And uh, we used to think that it would just be uh, 4,000, 5,000 years ago that we were constructing pyramids and that this is something that is, okay, fine. Like it was just that many millennia ago that humans could do that. And then we doubled the time period because Gobekli Tepe is just one example now of being able to move these monolithic pieces of stone into this spiritual location that yeah. we're hypothesizing right now, right? Yeah. That we think that people went there. But to be able to add, you know, a serious 5,000 year chunk onto human history and say, now we were doing that 5,000 years before that, plus being able to say, okay, we had a designated site where people were worshiping, in a sense, we can hypothesize about this, but that they were connecting with the cosmos, they're connecting with what had given them life and that they were here. And now today, it seems like we are so much in the metropolis is so disconnected with light pollution from our cosmos, so disconnected from when we take a sip of water to actually be truly grateful for that nourishment that we're receiving, it feels like we're wildly, in a sense, this Pinker argument, true in so many regards, but in terms of spiritual wisdom, Pinker's argument may actually fail in that respect, that we, our ancestors, may have had the edge of knowledge and spirituality just been pushed way further out, in terms, especially spiritual science. Look at the beautiful structures that were left behind versus now our spiritual science seems like it's we're still scraping pieces together like at least like the actual edge of knowledge has rescinded actually over time. What do you think about that? Mm, well, that, that goes a little too far maybe. Uh, I, in any case, I don't think that's what Pinker is talking about. He's talking about something of else. Of course, yeah. But I mean, he's the overall but, but, trajectory yeah, of the yeah. words that he said, the story that he's saying, and that you say in the moral arc and whatnot yeah. is is true in so many regards. But I think to say it's a scientific consensus that this is the best time to be oh, alive. Yeah, and so yeah. well, there's possibly actually one little aspect of it. Let's say for now that spiritual connection today when you're birthed into a metropolis is much more difficult to achieve than when you're born into a part of the world that doesn't have light pollution, we are connected to growing off the land, these types of things. You're walking to a supermarket, you don't even know who the farmers are. Versus when you actually go to a farmer's market, you can ask, where is your farm? Can I come visit yeah, your farm? Yeah. Big difference. I see where I see where you're going with this. It, and, and, and there's some truth to that in as much as, say, hunter-gatherers were taller, healthier, had fewer cavities, their bones were stronger, they had less arthritis than farmers a few thousand years after the agricultural revolution. So it was healthier to live in a uh, hunter-gatherer environment. And certainly Jared Diamond makes this point in his book, The Year Before, no, uh, The World Before Yesterday, I think it's called. Uh, and he talks about you know, the connectedness that everybody in a hunter-gatherer group has with each other, they care about each other, they know each other, and they uh, resolve disputes, so they just sit in the, in the quad area and they have it out, hack, hash it out, and they apologize, reparations are made, life goes on, and, and all that, that's true. Um, but, you know, we, we don't have that world, that world's never coming back, you know, and, and so, the, so moving forward, can we recapture some of the positive aspects of that? Let's get rid of the communicable diseases that killed almost everybody that lived by the time they were 40 or 50 and, and we get to live longer. Can we have the, the benefits of modern medicine and the spiritual aspects? Yes, we can. And I think there's a lot, enough movements. I've been to the Esalen Institute several times, you know, that kind of, um, uh, what did they call it, personal, uh, uh, s s per personal growth movement, something like that. I forget what they, they call it. but. You know, just getting in touch with the things that matter. I think that helps. Religion is one way to do it. As a reminder, once a week. I mean, that's why do people go to church? They don't go to hear a lecture about the, you know, the five proofs of God by Thomas Aquinas or, you know, what was there before the Big Bang type. They want to. They want it to be, you know, to, to hang out with their friends, and fellow community members that think like them. You know, we all need that, and so. But we can. You can get that now in the modern world. There's. A, you know, maybe Facebook Hangout pages are, are not the quite the right way for everybody. <laughs> I know a lot of millennials are into that, but not millennials, Z, Generation Z, I, I Geners. Uh, not, not my thing, but um, but I get it hanging out with my friends, our family, and, and anyway, I think I think there's lots of ways to get that, um, and, and we shouldn't. But, but I don't want to idealize the past. I mean, life was really was nasty, brutish, and short for most people. 
And you know, if you go back to you know people long for the live in the Middle Ages or before the modern period or something like that, they're envisioning they're the king in the castle where they have all the goodies. You know, 99.9% .9 of the world lived in abject poverty. You know, no, you'd be living in a mud hut. You'd be dead in no time, no running water, no toilets, no toilet paper, you know, no dentistry. You know, the food was basically just this bland gruel that, and you don't know if you're going to have it tomorrow. Life today is really better than most of that yeah, the world. Yeah, so to not forget exactly what you just described, Meanwhile, simultaneously revisiting past time periods where humans may have had certain aspects of their life structured in a way that is quite nice. And so that essence, so to be able to maybe balance some of that, those things of how humans could work together to do things, um, how humans could have potentially more time that was less distracted, more whole foods at times, all these different types of aspects, less fake foods, fake politicians, fake physicians, all this type <laughs> yes. of stuff. This, so the amount of maybe like self-dealing and other aspects of our family values not scaling over time are slowly looks like changing as we uh, decentralize a lot of the techno a lot of our aspects of living. And so let's just revisit this one aspect of it, which is, um, okay, within the, um, the, the, Within gatekeepers, I'm just Older curious. Gatekeepers, yeah, yeah, within gatekeepers, yeah. where, where, because I agree with, um, I feel like we agree that that there's, um, like you just described earlier, that the de the democratization of being able to spread um, truth, science, this type of thing, is actually really, really helpful, and it's awakening more people. Um, super true. At the same time, it's with corporations, with. Um, with certain groups that it seems as though are setting up purposely obstacles that make it more and more difficult to try and say, hey, is it possible that our origins are actually different than what we say they are? Or is it possible that there are oligopoly dynamics yeah. happening yeah. with corporations? There are gatekeepers for sure in business and in science. There's a reason for the gatekeepers in a way. Science is conservative and you have to kind of jump through the hoops and get the union card, you go to graduate school, get your degree, work with a mentor and so on. There's, there's reasons those are in place. And the reason is because most of us are wrong about most of the things we think about most of the time. So there has to be some kind of filter to, to, you know, to kind of to make sure you don't go off the rails down some path that we've already gone down and found out was the wrong line of research. So I'm going to guide you this way. Now, the, now the, the drawback to that, of course, is you may miss some of the creativity of somebody fresh, new into the field. And yet science does come up with new stuff all the time. So somehow or another, new ideas are not kept out by the gatekeepers. Uh, the, gatekeeper, the gatekeeping process works pretty well for filtering out fraud, pseudoscience, bad science. It's not perfect, but, uh, but it catches enough of the bad stuff and it still lets through enough of the new creative ideas that things march along pretty well. Maybe not as fast as we would like. Something like the FDA is maybe their filter is too tight mm -hmm. and maybe you want to go to a European system where new drugs can come on the market a little faster. Same problem, you know, with the gatekeeper thing. Uh, but if you had no gate gatekeepers, then we'd have, you know, the quacks on the street corner selling you, uh, you know, every you know, quack remedy for everything. and. You know, people would would not benefit from that. So we got to have something like that. Now, people like back to Graham Hancock, who I like very much. Likewise. He's, he's definitely an outsider. You know, he's not an archaeologist. He has no training, but he knows a lot. I mean, you know, he's traveled. He's been to he's some been of up the most of these sites. sites. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, his point about the gatekeeping is that the gatekeepers kind of keep him out. Uh, I'm not sure that's actually true. I mean, he's probably sold more books than all other archaeologists combined ever. <laughs> so it's like, well, Graham, you're not exactly unknown. You're probably the most famous archaeologist living today who's not actually an archaeologist. So, so the gatekeepers may keep you out of the peer-reviewed journals, but he's not even submitting work to them anyway. So his and his he gets on Joe Rogan pretty much whenever he wants, and he has you know 20 million uh, views of his various appearances there. So it's not like there's no voice for people like Graham Hancock. There is. Um, it, it, the problem that that he's encountering is that 
uh, I, we call this anomaly hunting. So he's really good at plucking out anomalies that don't seem to fit the mainstream theory. Like Clovis first, you know, okay, so when did the first humans come to America? 11,000 years ago. Okay, well, that appears to be a little on the short side. Maybe it's 13, 15, maybe up to 20,000 years ago, depending on this site, that site, you know, Mesa, uh, uh, not Mesa Verde. Um, uh, 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 anyway, it's escaping me at the moment. Um, uh, and, and there's a few others. And, and so Grant points to those and go, you see the, the old guards, the gatekeepers, you know, they did not allow in those older dates. Well, actually, yes, they did, because now we know about uh, those older dates. The problem when you then jump to like 130,000 years ago in reference to that find in San Diego of the mammoth bones, now, that's an interesting study because that was in na published in Nature, yeah. peer reviewed journal, by a real archaeologist, mm -hmm. you know, not some uh, alternative guy. Uh, okay, what do we do with that? Okay, we don't have to do anything with it. Let science carry it, it, it out and let other people look at the bones and so on. There's since been a paper published being skeptical of that. But if there were humans here 130,000 years ago, and then the next date to that is like, say, 19, 20,000 years ago. There should be hundreds, thousands, millions of fossils and tools and bones and various things to fill in that gap. So in time, in the course of the next few years or decades, either the, that gap will be filled or it'll turn out this was an incorrect anomaly, that the, it was actually the bones were broken by the construction project trucks and whatnot, not people 130,000 years ago. That's probably going to be the explanation. Well, but that's also, that's very hubristic, I think, because I think that there's so much that is still undiscovered in how we got here that still yes, needs to be maybe, uncovered. Maybe, maybe, but okay. So that, but that's kind of like a negative evidence argument that, that because you can't disprove it at the moment, therefore this theory is, is viable. No. How about so Karl Popper's conjecture and refutation. Conjecture all you want, but we're going to try to refute it. And if you can't fill in those gaps... Which over time will it, likely happen. Maybe. That's just, well, maybe. Our techniques are going to get better. That's why Gobekli Tebli and so many of the other ancient sites around the world, it's just like slow down. Our tools are going to get better. We're going to be able to really do things like you can actually use um, interesting uh, uh, radar techniques in order to identify some of the areas in the Amazon or Sahara or continental yep. shelves. These are very interesting ways of, of, of uh, using technology to better understand our origin story. But what about within the what about within um, the other spaces of, of our world? Like within, let's take other examples like the oligopoly dynamics that may be at play with technology companies or with food companies or with all of the different things that just seem like we don't <coughs> actually. The truth is being obfuscated purposefully in order for us to not understand what actually is healthy food or what is healthy use of technology. All these types of things. Yes. Well, how do we know about that? Because of whistleblowers and outsiders like Gary Tobbs and Nina Teicholz writing books about the food industry. Not just them. Others have exposed what the uh, chemical and food industry has done over the last 50 years. Well, so, so in, a, in a way, this is what we mean by science is self-correcting. But you have to have a free press, you know, open inquiry, lots of alternative places to publish and get your voices heard. You know, Gary Tobbs has been touting this, you know, uh, sugar and, and good calories, bad calories since the 90s. And, you know, he was considered a nut job and an outsider at the time, uh, pushing against the pyramid, food, food pyramid consensus. And it's looking like he was right. Now, so on the, on the gatekeeper thing, it's like, yeah, that, see, the gatekeeping didn't work. Didn't it work? I mean, now we all know about this. His books were published. I mean, his, his first paper was published in the New York Times Magazine. That's not exactly the gatekeepers have kept him silent, right? But, but how many decades has it taken for the gatekeepers of certain industries to continue to well, fuel the Well, the ship turns slowly. The ship turns slowly. <laughs> it does. The Titanic is moving too slow with the iceberg coming. Okay. It feels like that. Uh, and they uh, need to be identified. The, the gatekeeper lobbyist uh, mode building I, I, processes need to be I think the names have been named, down. you know, um, uh, Naomi Oreskes and her co-author, I forget his name, um, of the Merchants of Doubt. They named names in there. You know, the, they named the tobacco lobbyists who were hired by the chemical industry, who were hired by the climate 
companies to do the same people to plant doubts of seed. If you can do tobacco, you can do flame retardants and and global warming and so on. Uh, I, I think it's not a secret. We know which companies, you know, that uh, Exxon Mobil and the Koch brothers. We know who's funding these things. So they are part of the gatekeepers, but we're the gatekeepers keepers <laughs> we're you know we're watching the keepers uh that's why you absolutely have to have a free press yes to allow that. our cooperative processes in order to identify those and build things that obsolete those old systems is so critical and then another example is just that when you take something like things again things that we use every single day these these extraordinary pieces of technology that are actually uh being that have you, the psychometric profiles of two billion human beings that are then yeah, yeah. pointing at you all the time watching everything that you do to make it irresistible for you to get off of the device right. because the business models are tied to the time on screen of you watching advertisements or looking at them in the feeds. So again, these things, can we point out who's in charge? Can we point these things out? Can we say that we need to make it easier? Again, things like, why don't you tell us about with the thing that you just mentioned with the importance of um, freedom of, of, of press and freedom of enterprise. Um, things that enable us to actually uh, have new perspectives be brought in and then obsolete those old systems because this is something else that you're really passionate yeah. about next year. Well, you, you want to name names. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, there we go. Mr. Zuckerberg, what are you doing? Remember that moment in, in, in his congressional hearing? <laughs> this congressman is like, how do you make money? <laughs> Senator, we sell ads. <laughs> But it's free. It's like we sell the data. Oh, I mean, it's like everybody in tech, of course, already knew all this. But, you know, the general public, that was what, less than two years ago that this kind of became publicly aware. And it was like, Zuckerberg, do you, will you tell us where you stayed last night? And it was like, no. Yeah. It's like, well, why will you know where right, we stayed right, last yeah. night? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, again, I think the, the, you know, the solution to that is just pushback and just awareness. And the fact that you don't have to use social media, you don't have to do it. No one's making you do it. Uh, so anyway, um, and then what was the? Oh, uh, and then overall on the freedom of speech and freedom of free enterprise. Oh yeah. yeah. So again, I'm a big free speech guy. F f free speech, open inquiry. Uh, we got to have it again because most of us are wrong about most things most of the time. And the only way to find out is to interact with other people as much as you can. Mm. Just awareness of the fact that we all live in these silos, these bubbles, these echo chambers. Pick your metaphor. Uh, makes I think makes you aware that well maybe I should talk to other people that are not Republican or or Democrat maybe I should read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and and, and, and then see what other people are saying find just in case find your blind spots find your blind spots and I think you know the research on the backfire effect is now showing that in fact you can talk people out of their beliefs through better arguments and evidence this can work it's hard but. Yeah. You know, debiasing programs can work by making people aware of their biases. Those Teaching things can work. steel manning instead of straw manning. Yeah, exactly. The kind of stuff we're doing here. So, you know, the, the technology, of course, has its dark side. But this enables us to do like what we're doing right here, right it now. It does, yes. Uh, and, and there's tons of podcasts. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the, uh, the studies showing that the percentage of people listening to podcasts you know, every, daily, weekly, monthly, and so on, just is going up skyrocketing. As more people come online too. Yeah, and it's yeah. great. It's great. So this is this is what we're talking about with an, a free press. Yes. We're this is part of the press. Yes. You know, and uh, and and so you know, all the mainstream guys are having to scramble yeah. uh, to change their business models and so on to keep up. Good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. I mean, people were always worried about you know just a handful of half a dozen companies own all the major yeah. media. Sources, aren't you worried? No, I'm not because, you know, there's all these other platforms out there, you know, Joe Rogan and I mean, so they can squelch Alex Jones. Okay. But they're, you know, it's an open market. People can devise their own platforms and start something new. Yeah, it's, it, and one of the things also that that we're, we have to also be aware of is just that those the companies that we distribute these, these pieces of content through are able to have their own um, again, oligopoly dynamics of deciding on who they can restrict and who they can't, these types of things. So so that's why, you know, ThinkSpot, Jordan's platform, and all these other things are coming yes, up. And we'll, yes, see, uh, we'll see where things move in that direction. I am worried about uh, people like Dave Rubin 
PragerU videos being censored, censored, whatever they're doing, de demonetized, uh, deplatformed for certain uh, venues. You know, so I tweeted the other day, uh, you know, dear, dear Team YouTube, uh, I've watched dozens of PragerU videos. I agree with about 50% of them and disagree with about 25%, and I'm undecided about the other 25%. Please adjust your algorithm so I only see the ones I agree with. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, of course, this is ridiculous. Yeah. You know, just let, let everybody have their say. I, I understand. Th their concern, you know, that they were allowing ISIS people to set That's right, up. Yeah, yeah Things okay, like that. I, I get that. Don't uh, want to find beheadings on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, 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 of course. You know, those are the, you know, again, this is that sort of lifeboat ethics. What do you do with this most extreme example? And the problem is when you push toward the center where it gets fuzzier. Mm -hmm. You know, does, is Milo Yiannopoulos a right wing racist bigot? Or is he, uh, is he a performance artist? Yeah. Or a provocateur? You know, yeah. what is he? You know, it's those fuzzy areas. Um, where I think uh, they err on the wrong side. Well, we better cut out all these people. Draw the line here. I think you're drawing the line too far o over here. Bring it back closer to the no beheadings videos or something that's okay, yeah. much more obvious. Yeah. And once you get into like, well, Prager U has a video about progressive tax versus a flat tax. And, uh, come on, really? I mean, that's these are very debatable questions. Abortion, pro-choice, pro-life. Here's our video in favor of pro-life. That's okay, you know, that's, this is not a beheading video. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think they draw the line too far. Yes, yes. Um, and I think an, uh, just another um, last point maybe to finish up on is there's a, there's a growing amount of m interest in the idea of kind of what we were talking about earlier around, um, about, about oneness, about how we all from the Big Bang until now are coming from the same place. And we gave these scientific examples of where the cosmos are observing and experiencing themselves, that these types of uh, ways of, of living on a day-to-day -day basis, connected to that source, connected to that, this aspect of unity or <laughs> oneness, that we can remain skepti skeptical of it and I think there's a healthy amount of that that, that, um, that can be done, while simultaneously understanding that the f almost the faster that we can understand that we all come from the same place, the faster that we can all move towards yeah. similar I think ideas. that's what one of the best things science does for us, is it shows us the unity of all life. You know, Darwin's idea is, you know, we all came from the same ancestors, all of us. Not just all humans came from the same pre-human uh, species, but that all living organisms have the same DNA, uh, the same forced, you know, the same base pairs and so on. So there was only one Genesis moment on Earth and it came very early. And that's a pretty amazing thing. So we are all one in that sense. And if you want to push it back to the Big Bang, you know, we don't know why the laws of nature are the, the, the way they are and it's balanced the way it is and so on. And, but instead of going to the whether well, it was a fine tune or the tune the knob, how about just say we're lucky to be in a universe where this could even happen, where we get to be here and just be thankful for that. I, I do totally um, follow on that, just being gra grateful for being um, alive here. At the same time, I'm aware that so much more that, you know, Michael, we are such, a, a, such so small on the timeline. So, you know, 25 years, 50 years, 75 years of life of, of being able to just, you know, parse all information, try and input in what we think is the best uh, information to make us as intelligent as possible. And even then it's such a tiny little bit of all of the information. And so to, you know, to be able to look back at the hundred billion humans that built the world that we live in, or to look back at how billions of years of evolution finally got to this pinnacle spot of earth where we can be birthed and have life and be the cosmos observing experiencing itself. That it just, I, I, I want to just know, do you, you feel like it's still potentially more of like just an evolution of sentience rather than a divine purpose that I, we have? I would not use divine in, in, in the way that most theists use the word. I, I think if we, if we want to say the universe is divine because it has the laws of nature that gives rise to sentient beings, 
that then become aware of the universe having those laws of nature that give rise to sentience. Is that a thumbs up? If that's a th that if that's divinity, then I'm a believer. Okay. So okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. Cool. All cool. Right. Then, then I think we got on the same the same page there because okay. that that, that, that was a very beautiful way of of of, oh, thank of, you. of writing it because I. Um, I think that is what the wisdoms are pointing at, is exactly what yeah. was just described. Okay. That that is such a blessing that we are here, and because of that, if we, if we were able to understand that, if every child born into the world was able to understand that, then it would be easier to eradicate so many of the issues that we see in our world. But because we go to the ocean and we're like selfie post on Instagram, rather than be grateful for the fact that we get life from this. This is our life force. That that disconnect is the reason why we have so many of the issues. So that in itself, this idea of the unity, this idea of all that is or God or divine purpose that we have here. Yeah, Michael, I'm sure that like, you know, this idea of skepticism around spirituality, I think is very beautiful. We spent a lot of time um, the last time we talked on um, talking about skepticism around science as well, and um, also scientific advancements that have brought us here, all these types of things. So I think this has been a really solid um, piecing together on a second conversation. And I'm very grateful good. that you joined You're us. You're welcome. Thanks for coming to Santa Barbara. Yeah, it's such right. a, it was such a pleasure. You're <laughs> okay. super fun to talk to, okay. Michael. Huge thank you to everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on this episode. Do let us know what you think about skepticism around spirituality, around the topics that we talked about. To have more conversations with your friends, your coworkers, people online on social media, your family about spirituality, about skepticism around spirituality. Have more of these conversations around the world. And also check out the links in the bio below to Michael's work, his website, michaelshermer.com, as well as skeptic.com. Also, the links to the moral arc and heavens on earth are below as well. Do check out the books. And everyone, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them. Help them grow. If you believe in us, help support us so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to Santa Barbara to interview great people like Michael. All of our links are below to our Patreon, our cryptocurrency link, our PayPal link. Support us. Help us grow. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. <laughs> Would you say we did a good job on um, skepticism around spirituality? Oh, 100%. No, this was great. One of the best conversations I've had on the subject. Seriously. Wait, 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 wait. What? You just said that? Wait, come back. Come back. Come back. Wait, come back and say that into the mic. I'll put it in writing. Okay, okay. All right, all right. Oh, I love that. That's huge, Michael. The fact that you just said that is, is massive. I'm very grateful that you just said that.